You're listening to Uranium Spotlight Podcast, sponsored by PurePoint Uranium Group. If you're following this market closely, you'll want to explore Behind the Curve, Understanding When and How the Uranium Market Turns, a new white paper that shows investors how to spot the cues that come before uranium prices move. And now, your host, Chris Frostad. It's November 25th, 2025. And this week on Uranium Spotlight, we cover Japan's reactor resurgence and its new U.S. financing push, India's major policy shift opening the door to foreign reactor builders, a pivotal week in the uranium market, and next-gen advancing to the final federal hearings for Rook One. Last week, the uranium spot market eased as financial participants slowed their activity and discretionary buyers stepped aside. The spot price opened at $77 a pound and closed at $75.90, a modest decline, but part of a broader cooling after several weeks of steady upward pressure. Physical liquidity remained thin, and most transactions were attributed to traders rather than utilities, with volumes lighter than in prior weeks. The long-term price for the end of November was posted at $86 a pound, up from $84 in October. That continued lift in the term market reflects firming contract interest and aligns with the ongoing shift in utility behavior seen throughout the year, where duration and security of supply remain more important than spot volatility. Activity last week was dominated by financial sellers managing positions after the recent pullback in spot, though offers remain shallow. Several potential buyers chose to wait for clarity heading into the end of the month and ahead of expected December contracting actions. The spot softness contrasted with the continued strength in the conversion and enrichment markets where tightness persisted and where most utilities remained focused on securing long-range commitments. For investors, the key takeaway is that the dip in spot reflects a pause, not a weakness. The term market continues to tighten and the price separation between discretionary material and contracted pounds is increasing. The upward momentum we're seeing in the long-term market is one of the cues discussed in Behind the Curve, the white paper that shows investors how to recognize when uranium's real move is about to start. Get it now at uraniumspotlight.com. Japan's nuclear sector has accelerated meaningfully, beginning with the decision to return the world's largest reactor to service after more than a decade offline following the Great East Japan earthquake and Fukushima accident. That alone signals a policy and logistical shift. But the larger news was the government agreeing to a financing package reportedly worth $550 billion that would help fund 10 new reactors across the United States. These units would be built by Westinghouse, the U.S.-based nuclear firm co-owned by Cameco and Brookfield Green Energy Partners. Cameco and Brookfield have already announced a separate agreement to supply 10 additional reactors in the U.S., bringing the potential pipeline to roughly 20 new units. It has been many years since the United States saw reactor construction at that scale. The last project, the two AP-1000 units at the Volcal plant in Georgia, ultimately ran about seven years behind schedule and roughly $16 billion over budget. Westinghouse maintains that the lessons learned at Volcal, together with a modernized and digitally optimized supply chain, put the firm in a stronger position to execute the next generation of builds. Even so, the math is challenging. If one divides the combined $160 billion in commitments by the 20 reactors, the result is $8 billion per reactor. That's half of the vocal overrun alone. Such figures underline the pressure Westinghouse will face to demonstrate that standardization, better planning, and aligned supply chain can achieve commercial efficiency. Cameco's integration with Westinghouse offers advantages. The company is a major global supplier of uranium, conversion, and fuel fabrication, and it did not control Westinghouse during the vocal years. The combined entity now supports mining, conversion, fuel assembly, and key reactor components, and that vertical integration may help contain risk. Japan's renewed engagement also carries market implications. Physical uranium requirements for returning reactors will rise, and Japan will compete for origin-assured material along with new U.S. builds and existing global demand. That is meaningful in a market already tightening. For investors, this matters because Japan's return, combined with its financing of U.S. reactors, reveals a demand pipeline that is becoming more visible and more immediate. It strengthens long-term uranium requirements and increases pressure on supply sources that are already stretched. 
India is preparing a sweeping reform of its nuclear liability framework, a change that could reshape global reactor construction patterns. Under current rules, liability for any accident can extend indefinitely to the reactor designer, an unworkable condition that has kept U.S. and other private companies out of the market. Those rules are embedded across both the Atomic Energy Act and the Civil Liability for Nuclear Damage Act. Because liability is effectively unlimited under the existing structure, no private firm is willing to participate, leaving Russia's Rosatom as the only foreign builder active in India. Rosatom can operate there because the Russian state assumes the liability risk, allowing the company to further its diplomatic aims and strengthen ties with one of the world's fastest growing economies. India's leadership has now signaled that these rules will be changed, a position confirmed by the United States following recent high-level talks. If implemented, the reform could open the door for Westinghouse and other international builders. India's stated goal is 80 gigawatts of nuclear capacity by 2047, which is the equivalent to about 100 reactors similar in scale to the AP-1000. The country currently operates 24 reactors totaling 8 gigawatts and has 8 more under construction with 6.6 .6 gigawatts of capacity. Electricity demand in India is expanding faster than in any other economy. Climate pressures coupled with a history of blackouts make baseload solutions essential. Nuclear energy remains the only clean baseload technology that can be deployed at scale. Yet India produces only about 1.3 million pounds of uranium annually and relies heavily on imports. Domestic production is expected to meet with one quarter of future needs at best. For investors this matters because India's planned nuclear expansion is impossible without large and sustained uranium imports. That creates a new structural demand driver in a market that is already tight and getting tighter. NextGen Energy entered a defining stage last week as the company participated in the first of two Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission hearings that will determine federal approval for its 100% owned Rook 1 project. This milestone follows more than 12 years of environmental study and community engagement and comes after Saskatchewan granted its environmental assessment approval in November of 2023. The company presented a detailed project video to the Commission outlining Rook One's compact design, low environmental impact, operational controls, and the long term benefits expected for local communities. Over six and a half years of federal engagement have included the draft environmental impact statement in 2022, sufficiency acceptance of the license application in September 2023, provincial approval in late 2023 and federal acceptance of the final environmental impact statement in January 2025. The current hearings represent the final step before a federal decision. Upon approval, NextGen intends to begin construction and move the project towards development. Rook One is positioned as the largest low-cost uranium mine under development and is supported by a National Instruments 43101 compliant feasibility study demonstrating strong economics and industry-leading environmental performance. The company continues to promote the project as a generational asset for Saskatchewan and Canada. For investors, the key takeaway is this. Rook One is now at the threshold of full federal authorization, and a positive outcome would transition NextGen from regulatory advancement into construction, materially de-risking one of the largest future sources of primary uranium supply. Before we wrap up, if you haven't yet read Behind the Curve, Understanding When and How the Uranium Market Turns, it's worth your time. It explains the real signals that reveal when uranium prices are about to move, long before the headlines catch up. Order your Behind the Curve white paper at www.uraniumspotlight.com. You've been listening to Uranium Spotlight, your weekly podcast dedicated to the latest developments shaping the uranium fuel market and its role in the global energy landscape, sponsored by PurePoint Uranium Group. While our passion for this sector is undeniable, remember that nothing discussed here should be taken as investment advice. Our goal is to provide a clear and balanced view of the factors influencing uranium prices. Join us again next Tuesday for Uranium Spotlight. <laughs>